Mary Carmel News sent me in a link to a video. Is Russia finally done with Israel? Here's what she says. I know James works uh, and his mission has been primarily uh, calling out Israel, but I am confused as we know Russian oligarchs and the Bolsheviks migrated to Israel. Scratching my head on this one. Infighting or geopolitical interest. If you find the time, I'm missing a link here. Well, I think that's kind of what it was intended. But uh, I'm going to play this clip and I'm going to play a clip from Stormfront. And then I'll give you my breakdown on those two reports combined, which basically talks about what's going on in Syria right now and what they're leaving out. Welcome, everybody. You're listening to Wardo Rants, and my name is Eddie. So based off of the latest reports coming out of Syria right now, new rules of engagement between Syria and Israel have been okayed by Russia. Now, as many of us know, there has been a long line of Israeli airstrikes and Israeli attacks illegally on the sovereign nation of Syria and many others as well. But specifically in Syria, it has been a constant problem. Now, Russia has been this in-between man in the Middle East to try to maintain its dominance and play a balancing policing role in between the West and the East. Up until now, it has fallen short and actually persecuting the West and Zionists because, again, it was just balancing everything. If you want to know what I'm talking about in this case, go watch my video, What's Up With Russia, Israel, Iran, The Geopolitical Truth. It does a good job of explaining the entire situation from a broader context, including all the outside players. Now, according to the latest reports, this new rule of engagement is an eye-for-an-eye policy. Damascus will be responding to any Israeli strike. If it damages a specific military target, it will reply with a strike against a similar objective in Israel. Inside Israel. Decision makers in Damascus said Syria will not hesitate to hit an Israeli airport if a Damascus airport is targeted and hit by Israel, which this has happened on numerous occasions. It continues on to say that this will be with the consent of the Russian military based in the Levant. If this turns out to be true, this has very large implications. Because as it stands right now, yes, Russia is allowing Syria to defend itself, especially when it delivered the S-300 missile defense system to Syria after Israel used the IL-20 as cover from a Syrian rocket while Israel was intruding and attacking the sovereign nation of Syria. Russia seems to be completely done with Israel's shit. So, as the balancing factor as Russia sees itself, if this report ends up being 100% accurate, this means that Russia is okaying Syria to completely retaliate, not just defend, but to retaliate against any strikes from Israel using Iranian and Russian supplied missiles, mind you. So this is definitely a very important development. And quite frankly, this is probably what most people have been wanting to see. Now, again, this is early reporting. That's why it's important to take everything that is being reported early with a grain of salt, especially when it's something that people want to hear. Like I said, people are wanting to hear this. So could that reporting just be feeding into what people want to get more clicks? That's always a possibility, but since I've been running this channel and using Southfront as one of my sources, it is rare when they miss the ball on their early reporting. So, as it stands, if this is true, Israel attacks a Syrian military base, Russia is okaying Syria to then use missiles or airstrikes on an Israeli military base inside of Israel. Think of the implications there. It doesn't take a rocket scientist to really expand on what that means. So, if it's true, we will then find out if Israel is truly suicidal and if this is some kind of bluff or not, which Russia's actually not big for bluffing. When they commit to something, they commit to something. Now, some other important news is that Turkey's Erdogan has announced that they will launch a military operation against U.S.-backed forces in Syria within a few days, and this report was actually a few days ago. So, if that's true, in a broad statement, that basically means this entire yellow area. Any of this yellow area is up for being hit. And since Russia is now the arbiter on who can and cannot operate inside of Syria, if it happens, it's because Russia wants it to happen. And if Russia wants it to happen, it's because it's a NATO ally versus a NATO ally, and that benefits Russia, playing cut and dry right there. 
So what it ends up boiling down to is it more valuable to continue to have relationship with the United States in Turkey's position, or is it more valuable to eliminate that NATO proxy that Turkey also has to deal with on a daily basis because that spills over into Turkey in a large way. People like Kevork al Masyan from Syriana Analysis have been doing reporting on this, so if you're wanting to get up to date on the full situation there, I recommend his channel. Always good information there. Now also along that line of Russia being in charge of who's inside Syria, at least we not forget that the United States is still inside of Syria, holding that portion of the southern border in Antonov. Russian military establishes a base just north of U.S. held Tanaf region. So what is this telling us? Yes, it's a continuation of that. We're fed up with this crap. It's time to end it, at least preventing it from escalating. Some might say, well, why not just go ahead and kick the United States out? Well, it's not usually that easy because just going ahead and launching a full scale attack on this illegal invasion by the United States will thus be a major propaganda tool right into the pocketbook of these Zionist neocons that say, hey, look, Russians are killing Americans. That's all they want. They salivate at that opportunity, and Russia's not dumb enough to just hand them that on a silver platter. They would rather start planting bases around it and wait for the United States to make the big mistake first. That's just how these kind of things go. And we'll have to see how that progresses from there. Now, that's the most important things going down in and around Syria as of today. The Syrian armed forces will respond by force to any Israeli attack on its bases as a part of a new policy which was adopted by the Syrian leadership following the incident with the Russian IL-20 plane last September. The Kuwaiti Hour newspaper reported on December 15th, citing a high-ranked Syrian official. The unnamed official clarified that this means that a strike on an airport in Syria will be met with a strike on an airport in Israel and so on. According to the same report, Moscow gave Damascus a green light for such actions in response to attacks that would destroy the Syrian military capabilities or kill foreign advisors supporting the Syrian Arab Army SAA. The source denounced Israel's claims regarding the destruction of the Syrian missile capabilities and claimed that Damascus had received medium and long-range missiles guided with the Russian satellite navigation system GLONASS. The report says that the SAA can use these missiles to respond to Israeli attacks. Meanwhile, media reports appeared that an Israeli military delegation, which recently visited Moscow, complained to the Russian side that Hezbollah in Syria uses Russian flags to defend its positions and military convoys from Israeli airstrikes. The cover-up flags were reportedly seen in positions of Iran and Hezbollah in Hama, Homs, Idlib and the Central Desert. A week ago, Colonel Mustafa Bakol, a spokesman for Jaish al Isra, made a very similar claim. According to Bakol's claim, Iranian forces in northern Hama are raising Russian flags over their positions in order to protect themselves from Israeli bombardment. The most interesting question is if Israel was really able to identify these positions and was sure that there were no Russian service members there, what difference did the presence of these flags make? U.S. officials have threatened the Free Syrian Army against participating in the upcoming Turkish military operation in northeastern Syria, the Turkish Anadolu Agency reported on December 15th. In a message allegedly sent to different FSA factions and to the National Coalition for Syrian Revolutionary and Opposition Forces, Washington vowed to strike any group that would participate in the attack and to end its relation with it. During the last few days, opposition sources confirmed that factions of the Turkish-backed National Front for Liberation and the Syrian National Army are ready to participate in the upcoming operation with more than 15,000 fighters. In turn, the YPG expanded its operation against Turkish-led forces in Afrin. Over the past few days, the YPG claimed that it had killed five Turkish soldiers with an anti-tank guided missile near the village of Kimar, blown up a vehicle of the Sultan Murad Division in the village of Castel Migdad, killing two militants and injuring two, as well as killing four and injuring five members of the Sham Legion near the villages of Dersiwan and Nebi Huri. On December 15th, the US Bacterian Democratic Forces, with the YPG at their call, vowed a strong response to any Turkish attack, claiming that Turkish actions are undermining the SDF operation against ISIS in the Hajin area. An important thing to take out of this, basically, is it really is kabuki, and listen to this portion of this article. This is coming out of Zero Hedge, but they're actually parroting each other every one of these uh news outlets zero hedge this is uh what they have south front all of them 
they're all going to the same article. But this, uh, the Syrian political decision is based on a clear position taken by Russia in Syria following the downing of its aircraft on September 18 this year. Well, Russia should have done something about it instead of sitting there playing fuckwad bullshit. But okay, in 2015, when Russia military landed in Syria, it informed the parties concerned, i.e. Syria, Iran, and Israel. Well, actually, that, that included the U.S. as well, so don't forget that, folks. That it had no intention to interfere with the, in the conflict between them and Hezbollah, uh, and it would not stand in the way of Tel Aviv's planes bombing Hezbollah military convoys on their way to Lebanon or Iranian uh, military warehouses not allocated to the war in Syria. You know, and so what that was doing is really just running cover for Israel to con continue with their bullshit of attacking Syria. Now, let's get into some of the stuff that is not being mentioned by either one of these outfits. And you have to stand back, take a look at the uh, actual picture, the bigger picture, look at uh, alliances that have been formed and a couple other key uh, issues that are, um, in my viewpoint, uh, part of the target. So uh, let's break that down too. Well, to start this off, let's get used to the uh, term Greater Rothschild Empire instead of the Greater Israel Project because it really, I believe that was a misleading, it was a misleader. Because what we're really witnessing is... Uh, the Rothschilds actually taking control over all of Syria, Iraq, and we're, we're going to see how much that plays into Iran probably here shortly, but there's other things to take into consideration about this. So all of northern Iraq and Syria are now in Rothschilds' hands, all at the behest of U.S. blood and money. Uh, no, don't forget that, uh, well, Iraq's already done. It's a done deal. They got all of northern Iraq. With uh, northern Syria, that's on the northern side of the Euphrates River all the way up to Turkey. Uh, U.S. has permanent military bases there as per, who was that? Uh, Boy Scouts of America uh, gay dude, um, Rex Tillerson, that they, and uh, well, this map right here confirms that at any rate. So, you know, we don't really need to t take a look at every daily event that goes on there. Just understanding the fact that what we're witnessing is the theft of all these resources and the further balkanization so that they're more easily managed by uh, the little kike uh, infested uh, place called uh, what we used to be called Palestine. But at any rate, uh, let's just keep that in mind when we look at these things. And remember, as I said, we, we don't have to look at day-to-day -day issues that happen over there. Now we'll go take a look at some alliances that I think are key to this that are not being brought out and, um, and then how that uh, ties to the United States itself. All right, well, so uh, getting into this, first we've got to remember that the BRICS, that's Br uh, Brazil, Russia... India, China, and South Africa formed an alliance that was set up by Henry Kissinger, who was also the one responsible, or the main party responsible, for uh, the shift to American manufacturing to build up China. So in this, uh, we've got to take a look at these uh, alliances that have been forming between China and Russia, and uh, also remember their big uh, pact on or alliances on military, cybersecurity, uh, let's see what else, oh, oil and gas, and also the One Belt, One Road. Russia really wants to be a part of that. But never mind what Russia wants. What is Russia told to do? You know, that's what we should be uh, asking ourselves. Because if we look at Trump, the most divider uh, in chief that we've had in any memory that I can think of, has uh, put everybody and their brother against uh, the United States, including our own allies. 
uh, is actually connected at the hip with both Putin and Bibi Netanyahu, uh, and their ties go in through the mush, through the through the Russian mafia. Remember, folks, Trump has been run by Russian mafia since the late '80s, at bare minimum. Uh, and uh, but uh, go, getting to Putin and the bromance, uh, I reported on these things too. As a matter of fact, you guys should go check out. Uh, I think it was Rothschild's Communist China and the Destruction of America, or something of that nature. It's pinned on the top of my most viewed uh, on my BitChute channel. You should listen to that because it breaks down a lot of this stuff. At any rate, uh, so then we have Israel handing over uh, the port of Haifa, which is their largest uh, uh, port in Israel, and also gave handed that over to China and also gave uh, China contracts to build other uh, ports. So we know that the uh, One Belt, One Road will wind up going down into Israel instead of through Russia uh, or even Turkey, which would be the actual smartest way to take this because these guys are all controlled. All these guys are controlled, including China, by the world banking systems that we know of to be ran by Rothschild. Well, all over the news, there's uh, uh, this China celebrating 40 years of change and reform and all this shit. Well, what the fuck were they reforming from? <laughs> that would be one question. Uh, uh, yeah, if we look at Mao Zedong and the murder or the death of tens of millions of people and where that brought the country <clears throat> And then the last 40 years, which was uh, brought to fruition through uh, Nixon, George Bush Sr., you know, the one that's dead now. And, of course, Henry Kissinger, who should be dead, who was responsible for the rise of China. At any rate, uh, that was when the starting of U.S., technologies and manufacturing and all that started shifting over to China. What we got to remember, folks, that for over 100 years, Russia's been this boogeyman since the Bolsheviks. So I think that's kind of like we needed to build a new boogeyman. And this is a pretty ferocious one if you look at the tiger or whatever they're going to go by uh, in China because of the enormous amount of people they have for one and now with all of our manufacturing really shifted there we are not a sovereign country in the fact that we can't really do the manufacturing that it takes to really uh, support a, a major military uh, anyway so you know in Trump's uh, well we're gonna we're gonna spend more than everybody on the planet, you know, under him that uh, just drive us into more debt to build even more crazy shit. So we're kind of like in this Cold War 2.0, I guess you could call it. But at any rate, I'll go get into this article and then I got a couple other things that I want to bring to your attention that's happening right now as we speak. So Vladis Vostok, uh, Russia, from the P Pacific port to a Siberian trading range around 900 miles away, China and Russia sent an ambiguous message, an ambiguous message to Washington on uh, Tuesday. Under American pressure, these historical rivals have become allies. You see, they're pushed into this. It's 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 all intentional, folks. And Vladivostok, Russian President Vladimir Putin welcomed Chinese President Xi Jinping as the headline guest at an annual conference focused on Russia's Far East. They made pancakes together on the waterfront. Oh, how cozy. Uh, meanwhile, in Siberia, more than 3,000 Chinese troops joined Russian soldiers for the country's biggest military drills since the Soviet era. China and Russia regularly cooperate on bilateral exercises, but this is one of the first times that Moscow has integrated Chinese forces into its annual strategic exercises, typically reserved for Russia's closest allies, 
drones, paratroopers, artillery, warplanes deployed in mock battle uh, exercises. This year's Vostok East uh, drills have been built by Russian military as the biggest since 1981, involving about 300,000 Russian service members, more than 1,000 aircraft, 36,000 tanks, and uh, scores of uh, ships over the next week. In addition, the Chinese units underscore a potentially major shift. Two countries that had long been uh, considered each other's potential military adversaries are now partners in confronting the United States. Both countries are trying to signal if the United States pushes too far, we're going to move closer to each other, says Alexander Gubov, 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 Gabov, however the fuck you say it, uh, the East Pacific program at Carnegie Moscow Center uh, think tank. Washington is fighting the trade war with China and imposing mounting sanctions on Russia. The Trump administration has reoriented the U.S. national security strategy towards a great power competition with Russia and China, describing both countries as seeking to shape the world uh, anti-ethical to U.S. values and interests. Well... Don't forget, like I said, they're all controlled by the same fucking puppet master. And the shift was in de a deliberate thing. And then you got to remember that Trump is pulling treasonous shit right before your eyes. And nobody's saying anything about it, which pisses me the fuck off about him signing the USMCA, which hands over all U.S. sovereignty, everything, people, everything over to the United Nations, which is what? Let's do it for effect, uh, Rothschilds, okay? That is their tool. So now getting into this next bit, Trump's decision to withdraw U.S. troops from Syria startles aides and allies. Uh-huh. Uh, so uh, part of this whole thing is, uh, in my opinion, is part to uh, isolate the United States I've been seeing uh, reports how uh, eventually the United States would be basically forced out of uh, the Middle East, but this kind of takes it into a new uh, uh, direction, I guess you could say, uh, in that now Trump, one of them that was like, you can't you know, remove uh, troops and every, all the Republicans and neo uh, neocons and war hawks and shit, uh, would have would be flipping their lid over it uh, if Obama did it, but now remember Trump is getting done what what Obama couldn't. So in April, President Trump repeating his campaign promise to end the military involvement in Syria. Syria, I want to uh, get it. Out. I want to get out. He said, uh, "I want to bring our troops home, back home." Well, that's right, and 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 that, and we should. But uh, nevertheless, this is uh, there's always more to it than people get. In September, senior administration aides said at the time that the president was persuaded to change course. Some two thousand troops would stay in uh, Syria indefinitely. Well, uh, and what about northern Syria? That's what I'm concerned with. But not only until the uh, Islamic State was defeated, but also until a political solution to the overall Syria conflict was in place. In other words, turning it over to Russia. Uh, in a key part of Trump's newly announced Iran policy, all Iranian forces and their proxies aiding Syrian President Bashar al-Assad had left the country, so they're telling you, which I don't think is true. On Wednesday, Trump sets head spinning with his own government and around the world by apparently reversing himself again. His decision was made on Tuesday, according to people familiar with the issue, following a small meeting attended by only senior White House aides and secretaries of defense and state, and state uh, most of whom, if not all, sharply disagree. So that, you know, uh, is something else to look at. Just another thing to look at. There's uh, 
more we we always got to look for what's being done and what's being said what's not being said and you know it kind of bothered me that this guy uh he spent uh, uh his video was 12 minutes long and he spent uh, i think uh well he spent more time uh begging for shekels than he did actually reporting on it and so mary this is for you babe <laughs> All right, well, uh, anyway, uh, this twisted thing is, 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 is for me, it, it, I, I don't even really care about what's going on over there. I do, but, I, I mean, to me, the most important stuff was what's going on with the European people and the uh, dissemination of our country right before our eyes. And meanwhile, you try to talk to people about this shit, all they want to do is look at the fires. Oh, they're important, yes. That's a military campaign against killing Americans, our government. Uh, so where's our fucking so-called militia? You know, the ones that uh, help the Bundys and Hammonds and all that shit. Where the fuck are they at? Why aren't they uh, storming paradise and stealing their fucking military equipment? You know, that's the kind of things that I think about. Why, why aren't these fuckers doing this shit? Well, they're infiltrated. They're all feds, <laughs> you know. Uh, anyway, so you know what? I'm going to leave it there at this uh, report. I got other shit that I was already working on that I want to get to. But I wanted to get this out just because it was brought to my attention. And so I guess you guys with that, uh, Wardo out, huh? <laughs>